Good morning, good morning. Do you want to see what it looks like outside? There we go. Same as normal, wet and low white cloud. I'm going to creep out of here like I normally do, but there's nothing coming down because this road is shut because they're going to resurface the road. So take a good look at the road. These, all these reverse signs are the signs saying road closed. Well, I think they must have started at the other end because they're not doing my end yet. And here we go. Here we go. There's a hydraulic press channel on YouTube that always starts off with that. Here we go. When they crush something, they, can, they crush all sorts of stuff. Metal axes, drops of glass, plasticine. So anyway, how are you? How are you, all right? Yes, good, good, good. I'm sort of back into the routine at work. I'm Thursday, uh, I've worked all day Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Monday was really busy with patients, but funnily enough, not, not really busy, as in I didn't go home too late. And then Tuesday wasn't so busy with patients, but it was busy in that I started going, I went, I didn't get home till 11 o'clock. Uh, seven o'clock, seven o'clock. The reason being that uh, I had a lot of lab work to do. So I'm getting increasingly involved with lab work. Uh, trying to do it more like I was trained in the late 70s as opposed to how everybody does it now. So we're doing uh, impressions in compo and instead of alginate and by blocks with shellac bases. Oh, it's good fun. It takes a bit of time. But, uh, you know, that's the trouble. You see, if you finish at five, you might like, have an hour's worth of lab work to do, unless you can do it during the day. An hour's worth of lab work might be... Oh, what's he doing with his compressor? Oh, he's pumping up the tyres. Don't tell me he's actually going to move that bloody van. You can see what a hold-up it causes. Yeah, so, you know, it's amazing what you need. You can... Uh, I think that... We've set up a little lab. So you get a table, and then you need a, a grinding thing, and then you need a... Hoover because the grinding machine makes the right mess and then you uh, you need a vibrating thing for the plaster and then you need two types of plaster in buckets and then a scoop and then uh, some bowls and perhaps some measuring scales to measure it out and then we've got a mixing machine that turns the bowl round so that we can mix the plaster in two seconds flat that, I recommend that. There's only really one type you can buy on Amazon. It's not expensive and they're not as, quite as good as the old ones where you used to have a potentiometer on the front where you could rotate it and speed it up and slow it down. The one we've got has got a bright blue bucket on it, which isn't, which is, it's, um, it's got two speeds and, uh, you know, normal and, uh, and all over the walls. So you never use that top one. Well, you'll use, you'll use it a couple of times and then you won't use it again. Uh, what else can I tell you about it? Uh, because um, you need to sort of semi-mix the... Uh, plaster before you, before you start whizzing it because uh, you can't have any sort of free water left in the mix. But it doesn't matter as long as you sort of get it to the point where it's, it's mixed enough not to splatter out. And then literally within 15 seconds you can have it mixed. Now the best part about it is not the fact that, well it is the fact that it mixes quickly, but it's also the fact that you can very quickly see the consistency of the mix. 
So, <clears throat> although you measure the uh, materials out, because you know your plaster measurement might be slightly different from your stone measurement, might be slightly different from your um, uh, cafe plaster measurement. Uh, you can get obviously consistencies, inconsistencies in the mix and what you're looking for is a consistency that when the bowl stops the whole lot just relaxes and just slumps slightly down the edge of the bowl because you know that when you are ladling it into the impression on the old vibrating thing um, you, it'll, run, it'll run nicely into the incisal tips and also um, uh, you know, we had a couple of failures. There's about 100 ways to fail with this, and so you know, what you do is you work your way through all these failures, and then uh, <clears throat> and then uh, eliminate them all one by one. So your measuring uh, thing cuts down on sort of gross failures of measuring the proportions, and then all sorts of other things happen, like. You leave the impression slightly wet, and so what happens is that the um, the teeth all fall off because um, there's a layer of water between the. I don't know where you're going. Where do you think you're going? There's a layer of water between the, um, the first pore and the base, which is at the base of the teeth. So then all the teeth come off. Or you just do something, you know, like you pull the tray off too early, or you, you know, you're press it down too hard onto the table and so it ends up with no base and all the sides fall off and oh yeah there yeah we've got some of those little rubber bases which um, which I like and you know they save an awful lot of standing there scooping the excess plaster off with a plaster knife because uh, I don't have the time to do that I literally I've got, I've got five minutes to cast stuff up I cast it up and leave it on the rubber base and then Come back after about an hour and then and then get it off. Hooray! Someone's getting their cesspit pumped. You're reversing in there, which is fine. You've got bags of room. So uh, and then uh, then you need a Bunsen burner, and then if you need a Bunsen burner, you need a Calor gas bottle, and you can connect the Calor gas bottle directly up to the Bunsen burner if you like. But it's better to have it going through a lab a tap, you know, because then you can isolate the uh, the burner. You have the burner turned off, and you can also turn the gas tap off, which means that you can leave the butane cylinder turned on. Um, otherwise, um, you're relying on just turning the Bunsen burner off, and if you don't turn it quite off, then um, and you don't turn the cylinder off, which you don't because it's under the table, you don't want to scrabble about doing that, um, then what happens is there's a potential that you could just have a gas explosion because it could just leak away through the Bunsen. So, but even the gas tap itself is like 50, 60 quid. So it all costs money and we're gonna do it all slowly. And then you've got all the waxes, you've got your carding wax, your base plates, reinforced pink wax, sticky wax. Anyway, you know what, you know what's involved in a lab. You need a pin burner, which is a tiny little sort of finishing thing. Either that or a creme brulee thing. But the problem with these gas things is that they need filling up all the time. They're very good, but uh, they're a pain in the doodah, I'll tell you, to keep filling up. So anyway, the, the quality of the laboratory work is good. Now, we've got a problem with the fact that when we pay the lab to say to make a chrome denture or something then 
we include casting, that includes casting up the models and making the uh, special trays and everything. Um, which is, you know, perhaps we'll go back to letting them do that, but at the moment we're doing it because we're experimenting with what, what's important to us in terms of quality. Um, when you get a special tray back from the lab, you know, you might have to grind it a bit to accommodate the freedoms or um, uh, extend it a bit with green stick, you know. Whereas if you do your own tray, then of course you need your own special tray material, which if you're a, a masochist, you do it with methyl methacrylate. If you're sensible, you do it with this new purple light cured stuff. But um, yeah, so so we're just trying to work out what's the best way to do it, and then we'll just ask the lab to do it that way. We've put a big um, uh, th th thrust on um, impression taking as well, because our, our impression taking now we, we're really trying not to accept anything that isn't actually perfect. And by absolutely perfect, I mean doesn't even have those little blobs in between the teeth that you quite frequently get. So we're experimenting with different materials, different rubber base alternatives to alginate. Um, and uh, different designs of special tray, you know, some that are more cups round to retain the impression material and some that some that are more sort of uh, pyramidal so they come off more easily anyway the thing is and I've said this before about dentistry if you're good at something then you'll get more of it so if you're good with kids then you'll just have a cure of kids if you're uh, you've got a crown of bridge then you tend to get a lot of crown of bridge patients we've had quite a few patients go to turkey lately for um, full mouth um, zirconia crowns uh, which you know and obviously I don't know what the margins are like or the preps we can't see that but um, you know when they come back and they take photos of it it certainly looks good so and it's not it's not that expensive the problem I find with um further east you go the more root treatments you get you know so they will uh, they will they will root treat a tooth at the top of a hat a drop of a hat whereas um, in this country we you know it's a big deal if you need a root treatment um, I, I've got a lot of um, Eastern European patients you know who and it's certainly not uncommon to have half a dozen root treatments by the time by the time you're in your 20s um, which either means that they've, you know, they've had no dental care and then had a sh shocking amount of recovery work to sort of drag them back up, or, or just that the, the uh, dentists like doing root treatments out there, you know. <clears throat> the stupid thing is, they all seem to be done to a reasonably high standard. But let me just put my wing mirror up. So I can't, you know, I can't criticise them in terms of the quality of the root fillings. Some of them you can, some of them you can. They're not, they're not routinely brilliant, but I mean, I mean, just as a dentist, I find it hard to understand why a 20-year-old would have six root fillings done to a reasonably high standard. Um, they would have had to have had a lot of stumps, wouldn't they, to justify that? How can you go from no dental care to having? You know, probably as good dental care as anywhere in the UK in terms of endodontics uh, in in five years flat. Anyway, where were we? Got a cyclist coming up here. around him. It's the same cyclist, he was cycling yesterday because he's got light on his head, that's how I recognise him. 
So I was talking uh, last time about a failure and <clears throat> how to give up gracefully sometimes when you fail not to devalue the work that you did, you know, in, in trying to achieve an objective which you saw as a worthwhile objective uh, for the time that you did it. Um, and so what I thought about at the time was um, the opposite almost, which is the times that you get something for nothing. Yeah. So... I think it's worthwhile thinking uh, for ourselves what's the what are the times when we've been given something for nothing you know completely free and uh, I'm going to leave aside you know that people say well yeah the parents bring you up and your mother gives birth to you and all that I mean that's there's a point there's a point to be made there and not to <coughs> undermine the mothers of the world. But um, I'm talking about things like uh, when I moved into a new house, we had a, uh, an open fire, which was, you know, it was unusual for us to have an open fire. We didn't have anything that you need to go with an open fire. And the one thing we didn't have was a grate. And uh, we uh, got, got, bought some friends round, and we were sitting in this house, I think, the week we bought it, and uh, sitting in bucket chairs because we didn't have any, any decent furniture. We had more rooms than we had furniture at that point. And uh, this friend of mine said, Oh, he said, I've got a grate in the shed. He said, I'll give you a grate for the fire. So, <laughs> and I was like, Oh, that'll be really helpful, you know. And that, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. Just sort of doing someone a favour by giving them something that you've got and they haven't got and that you can see that they need. And I think that's... Uh, the way I look at it is this. You're... Uh, I've always, I was always told as a boy that if you steal things, then you'll get things stolen off of you. And I always thought that it was a, some sort of cosmological karma. But in fact, that's, it's, there's a more serious point to it. I always used to think, well, well not, you know, if you're a thief, then you're going to keep your own stuff locked up. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, it might be possible to gain, make, make a gain, gainful employment, in the strictest sense of the word gainful, uh, by stealing stuff. But in fact, not only is it very difficult to steal stuff consistently and not get discovered, especially in these days of CCTV, but also it's, uh, if you live in an environment, in a society, in a community or group, where stealing is the way of life, where it's the norm, then you will, fend, you, you, you will, <laughs> you will provide, you, you will spend your entire life fending off thieves from your stuff. You'll spend all your time just trying to make sure that your stuff doesn't get nicked. And a lot of the time you'll succeed and some of the time you won't. A bit like your victims, you know. I mean, people who don't steal stuff, that doesn't mean that they don't keep stuff locked up. They still keep stuff locked up. And most of the time it works and some of the time it doesn't. So... So basically, you live in a society which is a reflection of your own moral judgments and actions. If you live in a den of thieves, then you will get some temporary advantage by, by stealing stuff, but then you'll have stuff stolen off of you. So overall, it's going to balance out. And in the same way, if you live in an environment where... Um, you, you sort of give stuff away. Not everything, but I mean, you know, but as I say, under the circumstances, of it, you've got something, you don't need it. You find someone who needs it, who doesn't have it, uh, then, then you just give them what they need. And what you'll find is that if you live in a society like that, then if people see that you're in need, then they will give you what you need. 
I'm not saying you're going to get everything you need and it'll all be given to you free of charge, but what will happen is it'll come from an unexpected source because you don't know who might have the thing that you need and you don't know who might be motivated to give you the thing that you need. And then when this bloke gave me this grape, it was like, um, it came out of nowhere, you know, it came out of, I didn't even really, uh, I didn't realise that I was going to need a grate and a fire guard and a set of fire pokers and stuff like that. But if you've got enough, if your support network's big enough and you do just mention that, you know, you've moved into a new house and there's tons of stuff you need, you'd be surprised how much um, stuff you will get, <clears throat> will get donated. I think people are inherently uh, generous in their nature, uh, certainly with when they have a surplus, and uh, and that's the answer to a lot of stuff, like uh, such as you know if the government was smaller, who would build the roads? The answer is philanthropists would build the roads, and the same as philanthropists, uh, philanthropists uh, built the hospitals, and you know and. Uh, private investment built the railways and the other thing I remember was a firm called Lockton um, we, we had some dealings with them um, I wouldn't I'm neutral on Lockton because in, uh, in some ways they were good to us and in other ways they were they behaved like typical <laughs> city city wide boys in terms of trying to uh, you know, pay us less commission than they were supposed to. But um, uh, I uh, came up with this idea for a franchise, dental franchise, and um, we wanted to uh, hold a press conference to announce it. And uh, they had a, they got a very prestigious office in the uh, city, just over the road from Lloyd's, and they offered us a conference room, free of charge to hold the press conference. So, no, I mean, obviously that was good for them because it generated a lot of goodwill and uh, meant that they were in on the ground floor of the announcement and, you know, to a certain extent benefited from association with what was, at the time, a pretty, pretty new idea. Um, but again, it was totally free. I was like, you know, how much, how much well, we need to pay you for this 32nd floor spectacular conference room, you know, with views all across the city in this prestigious location. And they were like, no, you know, if you don't, we, we don't want money for it. Just come along and just tell everyone to turn up. So, um, it was quite, uh, I think that was the franchise announcement. It might have been the indemnity announcement. Anyway. All, uh, <clears throat> all lost now, like tears in rain. Ten points if you can say what film that comes from. And a hundred points if you can say who said it. You know, the name, the name of the character or the actor. And a thousand points if you can say whether he's alive or dead. <laughs> Uh, put your answers in the comments below without googling yeah so so I've had a few uh, bits of free stuff and I've given away a few bits of free stuff and the answer is you know the conclusion is you've got to pass your favour forward haven't you there's this thing on the internet where you know you might need an answer to something and so you post you post the question oh, I'm going to let you go and uh, and then uh, and then you know you take some time to answer someone's question. Now, the chance of that person then being able to answer a question that you've got is minimal because obviously by definition, almost they they know less than you do, so they're not going to help it. But by um, answering someone's question, then what will happen is that he'll have you know you'll have done him a good one, and so he'll be in debt really to the group and so if someone else posts a stupid question that he knows the answer to then it's incumbent upon him to pass the favour forward and, and answer that question free of charge 
and as a result the knowledge trickles down there's a trickle down effect from the people the masters of the universe in terms of knowledge to to the um, to the lower levels here I am bang on time 845 anyway it's been fun hope you have a nice day and I'll talk to you soon bye